intentions of the book in the second chapter. Uh, the first intention is to connect the recent body, body of um, Delia Giguette's work with uh, his earlier art to create a broader representational narrative and understanding the evolution of that narrative. Uh, the second intent that I bring out of this book uh, is the path to Ojo Ale, uh, which Dr. Falola defines as a stage of wisdom when the mind is free of fear, when reflections are communicated in idioms and proverbs, when silences speak volumes, and when the desire to reimagine the future against the background of the present failures takes precedence over other elements in the thought processes. And so what I'd like to do throughout this is not just outline the uh, state of clairvoyance <coughs> at the end of his career where he under where his projection of activism in art is clear but also outlining the path to getting to that point earlier on. Um, so starting with uh, chapter two, um, the first um, intention of this chapter places um, Professor Giguette as a cartoonist personifying identities as the angry artist, a spectator, an interrogator, an advocate, and an environmentalist. And I think this speaks to what's been already said about the multifaceted approach of his career and his artwork. Um, but it is what Professor Giguette does with his art at a technical level that sets the foundation for understanding the path to Ojo Ale. Um, first, the use of soft and loud colors to imitate progress, development, and remind the viewers of caution and violence. And this engages a reflection of social moods and values about struggle, power, and wealth distribution, specifically in the Niger Delta series. Um, at a second level, uh, Professor Giguette appeals to Nigerian creative past by referencing Stone Age um, artistic techniques and modern methodology. So this comes to the concept of civilizing the past, uh, which speaks to the contestation between modernizing elements and a revival of traditional elements. Um, this chapter speaks to the concept of uh, utilitarian traditionalism. So instead of art for you know a painting, you have uh, vases decorated or, or ornately that also have a functional use. Um, and so it appeals to those sentiments as well. Uh, the next chapter, um, which speaks about Professor Giguere in a um, cartoonist framework, um, is a series of four different dialogues with cartoonists. And this speaks to artistry in Nigeria as a whole and the larger field. Um, so the first interview um, speaks to a, the critical engagement with the popular voices. Um, so these cartoons are speaking much more to the, are speaking much less to the political elites and more to the public, uh, which explains why these cartoons were so prolific um, throughout his career. Uh, the second interview um, speaks specifically to the Daily Times, um, where there was a peak of cartoonage in 1998 um, and that particular publication had three times the number of artists as any um, other newspaper. And people claim to pur um, purchase this publication just for those cartoons. So that speaks to the affinity that these cartoons have with the masses. Uh, the third interview um, shows that cartoonists can function as constructivists, protagonists, activists, and media house craftspeople, but they're heavily bound to the popular culture. So functioning within that social framework um, they also appeal, again, to a multifaceted approach. And the artistic uh, nature of cartooning brings in all those different perspectives. Uh, the, the fourth and final interview speaks to the concept of self-censorship. So within the idea that you're appealing to a mass sentiment, you also have to be careful not to anger those masses and not to appeal to a certain segment of it because you will alienate your readers. And it speaks to the concept of the artist and the cartoonist having to engage in self-censorship and make sure their message is appealing. Uh, the next chapter functions to humanize uh, Giguette from a personal perspective. Um, it's a reflection on a series of interactions between Professor Giguette and um, one of his uh, former students. And it, it, in the humanization of it, it shows him as an ideal educator, someone who's willing to engage with anyone, even if they're not in his classes, um, even if they're not affiliated with the university he may be at at a particular point in time. And so again, we get the concept of activism through education. Um, the next chapter, which is chapter five, um, centers around the theme of all art being political. Again, we've 
discussed heavily already the concept of activism in art. Um, and in this particular chapter, we get at the concept of um, child rights and the identity of the child within the Nigerian social community. Um, so during the, time of, uh, during the time of cartooning in his career, um, there, at the orthodox narrative within the cartooning com community was that the child is usually present, but rarely are they the primary character. And he introduced um, lines of cartooning that went contrary to that, or that orthodox concept within cartooning. Um, so, for example, um, comics involve the world of children, um, but Kole Mole uses the facade to layer um, and thus protect the underlying social commentary. So there's a lot of um, commentary on the universal education policy that is portrayed through this that has serious um, political consequences, but it's masked within the Nigerian social concept of a child, which helps protect the artists and the artist's activism. Um, this raises a couple of larger questions about um, the difference between cartooning and comicking. And there's a great quote I'd like to read um, from that chapter. Certainly comics are cartoons and political cartoons are cartoons, but comics are not political cartoons, though they could be more or less political, and certainly political cartoons could be, um, could be in the form of comics. If this appears like a riddle, that is because it is. <laughs> and I'll just leave that for y'all to ponder, ponder over. Uh, the next chapter um, focuses on the concept of a warring, a, a caricature of a subject meant to instill criticism through look and laugh. Again, protecting real political commentary in humor. Um, and so, for example, there's the placement um, just empirically of poorly drawn editorial cartoons prominently on the front page of many Nigerian publications, and that functions to protect the uh, more critical and more clearly associable cartoons that are in the inner layers of the publication. Um, so for example, during the 1970s, Professor Jigede's style became um, much more articulate of the social commentary because of the protections that had been, been built around um, his cartooning and his artwork. Um, and again, this um, comes back in terms of oil paintings later on, where you have the use of ironic titles. and. Um, you bring humor into those into the situation of more formal uh, painting in the artistic world. Um, the final chapter that I reviewed um, talks about the series of flower power, um, and it provides a context for um, print media, especially the cartoon, um, in the last decade of colonial rule. So you see the extension of colonial rule cartooning through into, and a refinement of that into Professor Jigade's career. Um, again, we have the theme of children, where there is dichotomy, there are dichotomies um, put, uh, portrayed between uh, youth and adult versus citizen and state policies, and you have both those dichotomies and the meta dichotomies that surround them. Um, and then there's a commentary rising on the voice of, chi of, the, of the child in Nigerian society through this, where you have these portrayals of these prominent um, children in these comic lines. Um, so just to offer a couple of conclusions on the chapters I reviewed, um, first I'd like to speak to the methodology. I think the very mixed approach that each chapter takes um, speaks to the benefit and well-roundedness of uh, this first third of the book. Um, it, has testimonial, interview print, scholarly sourcing, and that all helps speak to the credibility of this work. Um, secondly, there's a lot of contextualizing throughout the sequence, um, which really aids the concept set forth in chapter two, um, and it provides a lot of background on the field for people like me who don't have a background in art history. <coughs> I, study med I study historical medicine in Southern Africa, so this was really helpful to me as a reader. Um, and I think the biggest strength of the book is that it asks these prominent questions without necessarily seeking an answer. For example, how does one not navigate competing calls for popular cultural and political expressions while avoiding state retaliation? How do we even begin to examine self-censorship? And how do we wield the unarticulated, the undrawn, and the dark spaces on the canvas? Um, 
My title is uh, Daily Jigide's Art, Interventions and an Alternative History. And it's based on Part D and E of the book Art, Parody and Politics. Part D comprises just a chapter by Adoronki Adesanya and Part E contains three chapters by three different authors. So what I'm going to do is to present a brief summary of the chapters and then outline or consider the author's arguments for the Lejegede's relevance and then place the book in a broader context. I'll start with Adesanya's chapter. Uh, this chapter focuses more on Jegede's painting as an alternative history of Nigeria and how these paintings connect with African and global issues. And it's the author's opinion that uh, Jegede as an artist or as a painter was influenced by the colonial education that he got, which gave him alternative avenues to, co to contemplate the politics of the nation state. At the beginning of his career, his paintings mostly engaged folk art. But by 1980s, we see a shift in this. And he begins to do paintings that engage the social issues in Nigeria's military dispensation. And his paintings go beyond borders, across borders. It's not just limited to Nigeria, but it also, it also speaks to challenges in other African countries, like the Rwandan and Burundi genocide. And it goes further to speak to the African diaspora, because there are paintings that deal with the American consumerist culture, as well as the challenges faced by the African-American youths due to the hip-hop culture. And then the portrait of Dele Jegede that Adesanya projects is that of the artist activist. You know, using his paintings to challenge the status quo, to prick social memory and hold the government to accountability. And this is important because it raises the issue of alternative form of history or alternative source of history. Through these paintings, it kind of maintains social memory because we know that in military dictatorships or in dictatorial regimes, there is this tendency to tamper with social memory, to tamper with collective memory. And then these paintings offer an alternative of the real authentic history of this nation, of the nation at this time. And at this point, I'll leave it at that. I'll get back to that a little later. And then I'll go over to uh, the next two chapters by Oguwole Family and Samuel Oweche. Now, these chapters deal mostly on the career of Jegede as an art historian and the approaches he employs in promoting contemporary African arts. The second author, Obeche, goes further by considering, considering a certain trend in the career of Nigerian artists in the US who, com who combine careers as not just artists, but also art historians. And then he discusses the challenges of legitimacy faced by African art history. They both project a similar image of Dele Jegede, that of the champion for contemporary African art. And that's where his relevance, according to them, based on the arguments, lies. And then Famule, first of all, he starts by looking at Jegede's field research-based writings on African art. And he raises one issue, that of patron patronage. The fact that patronage of African arts right from the beginning, from the onset, was mostly a Western phenomenon. So the West got to determine and decide what, what consisted as African art or art history and what, did they, what wasn't African art and art history. And this is an issue uh, Dele Jegide continually engages. And the two approaches he uses, he employs at this point, is curatorship of art exhibitions and then structured interviews of um, renowned art historians. And through this means, his goal is to re-educate the American public, the Western audience, on the true meaning of African art and the importance of contemporary African art. And then I'll move on to Obeche to say a little bit about that trend of um, combining careers and, as artists and art historians. He, because of this background, Jegede is able to combine iconic elements in African and Western culture. And this, based on the author's argument, he hopes that this would bring local context of African arts into consideration when frameworks for engaging African art history are being formulated. 
And he also reinforces Adesanya's image of Jegede as that of the artist activist. Because he discusses his cartoons and how he uses these cartoons to engage issues in the country, and not just the country, in the diaspora as well. But I have a brief comment on families chapter. You know, in, in part of the chapter, critical perspective section, he continually, this, he continually talks about the neglect of contemporary African art by even African art historians. But and I think that the chapter would have been strengthened if he brought in a dimension where we see why Dele Jegede chose contemporary African art as a career even against all odds, against the face of all, all the challenges, and despite the fact that he didn't have an advisor to supervise him at the point. So that's a dimension that would have been interesting. And then this, this takes me to the last chapter by Ugochuku Smoot Nzewi. And this chapter discusses Jigide's career and skill as a, a curator, which stems from his desire to confront issues that cannot be addressed effectively through art historical writing or studio practice. And now the, the curator, initially the curator used to be more in the background, but the job of a curator has evolved over time to, you know, he has the power to impose meaning on art. And this is where uh, Jegede's position in this regard becomes strategic, because then he uses his curatorial projects to re-educate the public the Western audience on the true meaning of African art history. And the, he engages smaller projects rather than big survey projects where you know, significant meanings can get lost easily. And then he also focuses on fewer artists and promotes the work of unknown artists. And yeah, in this way, promoting them. So for him, exhibition is a tool for implanting alternative visions of Africa and African art. And I would now place the book based on these chapters in a broader context. First of all, it raises one important issue, especially to me as a historian, that of art as an alternative history. Uh, you know, when you consider the part, Jegede's paintings and the nature of his paintings, it brings up the issue of visual arts as a form of writing history or as evidence in writing history. Because in situations where you have social memory tampered with, where you have portions of a nation's history ero eroded for one reason or the other by the powers that be, you see art coming into play in this regard to recapture this history or to raise questions on this aspect of history. It can, it, it can counterbalance the archives, the archival sources. No, this is not without its own um, weaknesses. Because art, painting, for instance, reflects the painter's personal bias. But this will not be unique to paintings or to visual arts, because the archives also reflect the, uh, the, the personal bias or the opinions of whoever is recording that information, that data. Written sources have the same weaknesses. So yeah, it calls scholars to look at paintings, other visual arts as evidence, as forms of, as forms of recording history and um, preserving social memory. And it's also relevant to the diaspora studies. Like I mentioned before, it engages issues in the American culture. And not just that, it shows how Dele Jegede navigates his um, position, not just as an African artist, but as a, an African artist in the diaspora, how he is able to place himself between these two dynamics. And then finally, um, it raises the, the point of an activist, like more of a, a redefinition of an activist. I would consider the artists or the painters as subalterns when it comes to activism, because when we talk about activism, what easily comes to mind is the political activist who carries placards, organizes rallies, but how about the artist, the painter, who confronts these daily issues by his paintings, who keeps breaking uh, the society's consciousness, how about, so it raises the issue of alternative forms of activism when you talk about the nation state. And finally, it invites scholars to deliberate on how to convert arts into an effective tool for initiating social change. 
So it's not just about there. It's one thing to paint, and it's another thing to to make it work, to make it impact on the society. So the question I'll leave us to deliberate on is this: What options does art present in shaping the politics of the nation and in enforcing real and active change? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, of course, my name is Daniel Jean-Jacques, and uh, I'd like to open with an apology because I'm pretty much the archetypical Philistine. Um, if anyone has a sling in the room today, I'm in a lot of trouble. Um, despite that fact, I'm going to attempt to engage this, to engage this book, which is, of course, focused on art, art history, and uh, I apologize in advance for my, uh, my naivete in, in this undertaking. Um, the two th sections I focused on were uh, part F and G. Um, which really center around the nexus between art, politics, and activism. Um, and then also engage uh, Dr. Jigede's work outside of his uh, artistic production. So Jigede as, uh, as activist, you know, off the canvas, off the page, as well as uh, Jigede as uh, administrator. So I'll just sort of jump in and engage e each author uh, one after the other here. Um, so <coughs> chapter 12 uh, by Onoyom Godfrey, Pong is uh, delegating artistic strategies in the state. Um, what Pong is doing here is situating Jigede in the wider context of uh, um, what I think he would define as an artistic, tra an African artistic tradition, um, and he even sort of alludes to a even broader sort of uh, artistic tradition associated with even the evolution evolution of civilization. Um, I'll get into that a little bit here. Um, basically, Upong is arguing that art and, state, uh, art and state come into maturity more or less simultaneously. So the explosion of art is associated with the rise of the cities and uh, with surplus and larger populations. And uh, he infers from this that art and state are intrinsically linked, that they form almost a symbiosis. Um, not to say that art is promoting the ends of the state, but art serves to shape the state as state shapes art. Um, he draws this relationship throughout uh, history, but emphasizes it particularly in the African case, and more specifically even in the Nigerian case, where he tracks the role of art uh, following the Civil War um, in the 60s um, as a reformer and uh, you know, an exposer and uh, sort of a, a medium for the resolution of conflict and uh, um, what would be the word there? Conflict and uh, paradox is not the best word, but. I'm getting a con contradiction, thank you. Um, effectively highlighting anomalies in the uh, democratic process, or in the democracy, the process of democratization, excuse me. Um, getting into uh, Dr. Jigede's work specifically, um, Ukpong highlights the purpose-driven nat nature of uh, Jigede's work um, as an educational medium, and also as a substantive medium, sending messages um, to everyday people as well as to authorities and to uh, more scholarly source, uh, audiences as well. Um, one thing I particularly enjoyed uh, about this article was uh, his description of the way Dr. Jigedi's work captures um, the patient observer, I guess is the way he would put it. Um, he describes Jigedi's work as opening, opening up as you observe it with a deliberate disorder, um, which he describes as counter-reflexive to the point of almost causing irritation but with, pa with patience, that becomes the source of appreciation. And I mentioned before that I'm quite a Philistine, so I read something like that and sort of brush by it, but uh, I tried it. I opened the panels, and I found that uh, Dr. Rupong was correct, at least in my case. Um, it gave me a new sort of heightened appreciation of the work. Um, I'm going to engage in critique as well, so I do so with great humility. Um, my first point uh, with the, uh, my first uh, issue with uh, Dr. Rupong's article um, is that perhaps the art-state link, which he draws back to the Paleolithic period, or I suppose the Neolithic period would be a better description, um, may be too strong. Perhaps, I would argue, art could be associated with other things than this sort of symbiosis with state. I mean, there is, a, I think, room for art as expression, you know, perhaps even for expression's sake. I think of, you know, several movements in art have uh, highlighted that. Um, I also... Uh, I took exception, you know, not, uh, not offense, but a slight exception to the point that he makes, uh, or to the emphasis he makes in African art as uh, being politically active. I would certainly not discount African art 
as uh, politically activist, but um, I think it also limits um, African art when one establishes this sort of activism paradigm. You know, why can't African art also be fun? Why can't it express things that get outside of the political? Um, so I humble, humbly submit those critiques uh, for Dr. Upon. Um, the following chapter um, by Dr. Adaronke Adesola Adesanya, um, Sketching Maladies, Making Meanings, uh, Dele Jigedi's Scriptorium and the Characterization of the Nigerian State, um, engages Dr. Jigedi's uh, work as a cartoonist. Um, I found uh, her description of the cartoonist, her analogy, metaphor is a better term, um, for the cartoonist particularly interesting. So she portrays the cartoonist as the monk or nun sort of uh, in, in, encapsulated in uh, his or her scriptorium and uh, sort of chronicling and critiquing the society surrounding, so sort of engaging in this same function as, the, uh, as sort of the, uh, the sacred devotee. I found that fascinating. Um, she also focuses in um, on the tools associated um, with the scriptorium, um, which she basically lays out as uh, the layering of meaning, the masking of critique, the unmasking of injustice and uh, the employment, of course, of the double entendre, which would be interwoven with all of these uh, with all of these techniques, and of course, these are techniques that uh, she describes uh, Dr. and I think rightly so, Dr. Jigedi as being a master of. Um, she also uh, engages Juvenal and Horace um, as sort of uh, her com her uh, sort of bases for comparative analysis. So we jump a few thousand years back. Um, emphasizing juvenile sort of harsh styles, or really sort of rude satire, and uh, Horace's more gentle um, approach, more uh, sort of measured approach, and uh, basically argues, and I think again correctly, that uh, Dr. Jigedi is able to balance these two approaches. So um, she describes it as taking a measured approach, but still uh, engaging the vehemence of, of an angry man, you know, sort of a frustrated utopianist you know, venting, you know, the, the frustrations of a society. Um, <coughs> in this expression, she identifies uh, effectively three maladies, three primary maladies of the Nigerian state that really shine through um, in Dr. Jigede's work. Um, the first is uh, a state of complacency, the complacent state. Oh, I've come to three minutes, so I'm going to have to accelerate considerably. Um, let's move on from uh, Dr. Adesanya for now. Um, Equamisi's Images of Reason, Jigede's Cartoons and the Years of Waste, um, engages his, his years as a cartoonist, not so much, or his work as a cartoonist, not so much through the work as through the social context. Um, effectively, Equamisi is uh, painting a picture of a post independence period um, characterized by post colonial representation, neo colonial. Uh, Relationships here, and um, you know, especially as we get into the Second Republic, of uh, the the plundering of state by politicians, and we get into Babangida, things intensify even even more severely. And uh, cartoonists like Jigede emerge as some of the the heavy, the most uh, effective cr critics of this uh, sort of state of uh, you know this sort of predatory state taking place in this period of time. Um, and Jigede's multi multifaceted approach. Um, in his view, combines the, really the best of the values of the Enlightenment and the Renaissance um, with what he terms the dignified restlessness of the Romantic spirit um, to form so some of the best critique of the period um, and continuing on into our period right now. Um, the only uh, comment I might have there is uh, I hate to see uh, you know, a contemporary African artist sort of placed within the context of the Enlightenment and the Renaissance. I think uh, you know, we had some discussion of that um, earlier after the, in the question and answer for the keynote speaker. Um, this idea of going back to sort of these old paradigms, are we going to sort of fit into a Western model or are we going to create a new one? Um, so I'm not saying that that's an incorrect approach, but I would like to see uh, Dr. Jigede and, and other artists like him, sort of uh, perhaps other artists being compared to him as opposed to being placed into these Western, uh, into these Western models. Um, moving forward, Dele Jigede, More Than a Painterly Eye, um, by Ajiboye, Ajiboye um, focuses on uh, Dr. Jigede's 1991 exhibition of paintings focused on urban life in Lagos. Um, I'm out of time, so I'll just whip through this real quick. Um, he compares Dr. Jigede's work um, to a variety of, or to several other artists working on uh, Lagos subject matter. Um, to explore if Dr. Jigede is engaging objectively um, 
the realities of Lagos life. And he comes to the conclusion that yes, he is. Um, my only critique here would be that uh, it's difficult to define one Lagos life. Uh, I grew or one Lagos life. I grew up in a town of a hundred thousand, and uh, I could, you know, name off many Lakelands. And if you traveled to Lakeland, there would be many more that I couldn't name off or describe. And uh, Lagos dwarfs Lakeland, so I think uh, limiting uh, Lagos to one objective reality might be a limitation. Nonetheless, um, Ajiboye. Um, expertly brings out um, Dr. Jigede's skill in bringing to life this, you know, I would say a city in transition and the difficulties of that transition and the way that a population is sculpting a landscape beyond the authorities, the political authorities, the intellectual authorities. So it's, a, it's an organic movement. And I know I'm over, I'll, I'll wrap it up right now, but I'd just like to take a moment as the last of the presenters to thank Dr. Jigede very much for indulging a, a few humble grad students um, <laughs> and uh, also for uh, gracing our campus um, with your presence today. It's an honor and, uh, and an intimidation also to be at the table. <laughs> and thank you also to my advisor, Dr. Falawa, and to everyone for your attendance.